Before I preach tonight, I want to thank you, uh, dear folks at Copper Springs, for allowing me to come and preach to you these five times. I've enjoyed my visit. I felt right at home. I've been comfortable, and I've enjoyed your fellowship. In fact, I think I like you folks. <laughs> and uh, when you're over in the Heber Springs area, give us a call and come by our place and allow us to reciprocate hospitality with you there. Tonight I shall preach to you from Isaiah chapter 6, and I want to talk to you about the holiness of God. I have not preached often on the holiness of God because of my inability to comprehend the absolute moral perfection of our God. And because of my inability to adequately communicate what little I have comprehended about the holiness of God. But nevertheless, after the manner of a mortal man, I shall preach to you on this grand theme. Are you interested? Verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved, at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongue or tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. I shall preach my sermon around three headings. First, I will give you the historical circumstances. It was in the year that King Uzziah died. Secondly, I shall talk about the holy confrontation. Isaiah sees the Lord. And thirdly, I will talk about this heartfelt commitment that he makes. Here am I. Send me. Now, by way of the historical circumstances, I will remind you that Uzziah had been a good king in Israel. Much of the hopes of the nation had rested in Uzziah. In the latter years of his life, he was a leper. 
a stark contrast comes into view. Earthly kings die, but King Jesus still lives on. Isaiah had been a prophet and a statesman during the administration of King Uzziah. Often, uh, the death of the king is a dark and dangerous time in the life of a nation. Isaiah's ministry would be crucial at this time. Consequently, God appears to Isaiah and reveals his presence, his person, his plenitude. Uh, this will strengthen his hand. It will encourage him in the work at this time when Uzziah has died. Now let me tell you more specifically who it is that Isaiah sees. He does not see Jehovah God. He does not see God the Father. He sees a pre-incarnate vision of Jesus Christ, a theophany. Uh, we are told in Romans chapter, or pardon me, John chapter 1 verse 18, no man hath seen God at any time the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. We're told in John chapter 12, verse 41, this spake Isaiah when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Isaiah sees Jesus Christ in all of his resplendent glory and holiness. Now some of the Bible scholars suggest that it's here in Isaiah chapter 6 that Isaiah is first converted and commissioned to be a prophet. I do not believe that. To be so, I suggest to these brethren that they ought to read the first five chapters before coming to such a conclusion. These will suffice for the historical circumstances. We'll spend most of our time now talking about this holy confrontation between God Almighty and his prophet Isaiah. I have two divisions here. One, I want to talk about the true character of God, and then I want to talk about the terrible condition of Isaiah. Are you aware that the revisionists in our day have constructed a God that the Bible knows nothing about. The Bible says that God created man in his image, but today man has created God after man's image. And I cannot think of a single item that is needed more in the modern church than a fresh glimpse, a new vision and understanding of the true character of God. God is not a cash cow. God is not just a grandfatherly type twiddling his thumbs, rocking out on the front porch, just waiting for his children to come and ask 
for something. And the Christian religion is not so much about man as it is about God. We've got to quit preaching a man-centered religion and go back to preaching a God-centered religion. The true character of God. Now let me show you two things. I want you to see His power. He's the Lord of hosts. And I want you to see His purity. He's the Lord of holiness. Now I'm going to point out five things that relate to his power. Number one, I want you to see the remarkable transcendence. He's high and he's lifted up. Two, I want you to see the resplendent temple. Isaiah sees the Lord in the temple. And number three, I want you to see the royal throne. He's sitting upon a throne. And number four, I want you to see the regal train. His train fills the temple. And number five, I want to speak of the resounding terror of the Lord. The post of the doors moved at the voice of him that spoke. Now, let's return to this first item, the remarkable transcendence of the Lord. He's high and he's lifted up. Now, when we speak of the transcendence of the Lord, we do not mean to imply that he's a God afar off and not a God close at hand, no. But we do mean to say that he transcends all of human comprehension. He transcends all of time and all of space. He's a big God. The God of the Christian religion is a big God. He is not impotent. He is not dependent upon man. He is self-existing. He's a big God. I mean, if you could board an intergalactic spacecraft and travel back into time, you could never go far enough but what God would be beyond that. I mean, if you went back to the dawn of creation as we know it, you would not have gone far enough, but what God was still beyond that. I mean, if you went back to a time when the unnavigated ether of endless space had never been disturbed by the brush of an angel's wings, you would not have gone far enough. God would still be beyond that. The remarkable transcendence of God. He's high and lifted up. This speaks of his separateness. We don't gather to have a pep rally. We don't gather to say, give me a J, give me an E, give me an S, give me a U, give me an S. We gather to worship this great God, this God whose name shall be great among the nations from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. His name is great. The remarkable transcendence. 
Now I want to talk about the, the resplendent temple. Isaiah saw his vision of God in the temple. God said to Solomon, The heaven, nor the heaven of heavens, can contain me. And yet, God has been pleased to dwell among men on earth. And there's a temple on earth at this time. And yet there's a temple in heaven. And for those of us who are redeemed, God has been pleased not only to dwell among us, He dwells in us. And our body, are temples of the Holy Spirit. Now, about half of the scholars say that Isaiah saw this vision in the heavenly temple. When you read the book of Hebrews, you discover that there is a temple in heaven and it served as a pattern for the one here on earth. But the rest of the scholars agree with me. He saw this vision in the earthly temple. Now you folks are aware that there's a difference between exposition of Scripture and the supposition of the preacher. You know that. I'm going to have to wait till I get home to heaven to let you know for sure. Now I want to talk to you about the, the royal throne of God. Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on the throne. Well, why shouldn't he be on the throne? He is King Jesus, after all. That's why the church gathers and sings, All hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel, King of kings, Lord of lords, bright morning star. Uh, that's why the church gathers to sing, Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. He's not going to be Lord. He is the Lord. And he's not Lord because he's risen from the dead. Conversely, he's risen from the dead because he was Lord before he ever died. That's what gives significance to his death. The church gets its authority from its head. And its head is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, if you got the money in the bank and vote unanimously, you still don't have the right to proceed until you've sought the mind and gained the permission of him who sits on the throne. And I want to tell you the Christian life, its sum and substance boils down to this that you are clay in the hands of the potter. And this, this business of being a Christian is being sanctified, learning obedience, learning to walk humbly before Him who is the Lord. Are you all getting any of this? Let me talk to you about the regal train of the Lord. His train filled the temple. You are aware that oriental kings wore long flowing robes. The train was that part which flowed behind and drugged along the floor. It was a mark of distinction. It was a symbol of honor. Are you aware that the Bible talks about a time when the whole earth 
shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God like the waters that cover the sea. I tell you what we do here on earth, what we do here in the church ought to be a reflection of the glory and the splendor of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to be done to His honor. It's to be done according to His specifications. He's the Lord. We ought never to do something deliberately that would dishonor the King. Uh, let me just mention an example. Our Lord told the Father in the high priestly prayer, He prayed that you and I might have unity in the church that we might be one with Him, even as He is one with the Father. I tell you, beloved, I'd hate to be the one who was always griping and complaining. I'd hate to be the one who always was the negative vote. I tell you, I believe the church could take a dozen votes if there's a hundred people present, There'd be one in the bunch who would vote negatively every time. That dishonors the Lord. Are you all getting any of this? Let me talk to you now regarding the, the resounding terror of the Lord. The post of the doors moved at the voice of him that cried. The old preacher Matthew Henry says, Shall the post of the doors be moved at the voice of the Lord and the church sit still and be complacent? This is the true character of God. Now, I'll put that aside. Uh, having talked about His power, I want to talk about His purity. And there are two things here. One, the song of the angels and the sanctifying altar. Now regarding this song of the angel, I thought that I would be high sounding and refer to this as the seraphic antiphony. But to tell you the truth, I wasn't sure what that meant. And I decided to just stick with the song of the angels. Did you hear them? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Now, you are aware that in those days, repetition was used to establish a fact. But could it be that the angels themselves are Trinitarian in their views about God? Could it be that one cried, Holy art thou Father? And another cried, Holy is the Son. And yet another to the Holy Spirit. Here, the highest order of created beings give triple voice, singing, Holy is the Lord. How could the church do less than this? But I want you to see a second thing regarding His power and His purity. I want you to see this sanctifying altar. Now I'm going to talk more about it in a moment. I just want to point out the fact of its existence. Then flew one of the seraphim with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. Listen now, when you come into the close 
intimate presence of God, you are going to be more grateful than ever before that he has provided an altar, an altar that cleanses, an altar that sanctifies. You don't want to come into the presence of God without being cognizant of your need of cleansing, of your need of a sanctifying altar. It's because of the holiness of God. He is of purer eyes than to behold evil. This is the true character of God. Why don't we commit tonight to praying that God would send His church a fresh vision of who He is, His true character. Now, having talked to you about this, I want to talk to you about the terrible condition of Isaiah. Two things, one, his plight, and two, his purging. Did you hear him? Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. What a man said and what a man did was indicative of who he was. You could not separate what he said from who he was. Here, Isaiah is confessing the the terrible condition of his own heart when he comes into the presence of the Holy God. And I tell you, beloved, that's going to be the condition of every one of us, even those of us who are redeemed. I've wondered what might have happened if many in our day had seen this vision. Oil Roberts would have said, hot dog, I'm going to raise more than eight million this time. Benny Hinn would have slain the angels in the spirit. They'd have fell over colder than a wedge. Kenneth Copeland would have bought a new Learjet. He'd have made a video. What'd you say? He'd have made a video depicting this vision of the Lord. He'd have had the temple, the throne. But I want to tell you, beloved, it wasn't so with Isaiah. He felt his own unworthiness. He felt his need of this sanctifying altar. I want you to see his purging. Then flew one of the seraphim with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. I want to tell you, beloved, there's but one thing that can remove sin and purge an iniquitous heart, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ that has been sprinkled upon the altar in the heavens. Come to God by Him. Do not come any other way. You will be rejected as a thief and a robber. Come to God through Jesus Christ. Now I want to talk to you about his heartfelt commitment. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. 
If you're going to go for Jesus, if you're going to own the name of the Lord and be called a Christian, you ought to know something about the true character of God. You ought to know that His remarkable transcendence speaks of His immensity, that the resplendent temple speaks of his excellence, that the regal train speaks of his effulgence. You ought to know something about the God that you represent. You ought to know that the, that the resplendent temple of the Lord represents his government. And the train, his glory, and his grandeur. You ought to know that his remarkable transcendence represents his separateness and the royal throne, his sovereignty, and the regal train, his splendor. If you're going to bear the name of Christian, If you're going to own the name of Jesus, seek to know who it is that you represent. If you're going to speak for the Lord, you ought to have seen something of the true character of God. And you ought to have sensed His voice in the word of the Lord saying, Who shall go for us? And you ought to bend your knee. And you ought to bow your heart. And you ought to cast off your pride. And you ought to cast off having your own way and being petty. And bow your heart and say, Lord Jesus, where you send me, I'll go. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him all the way. Ready to go, ready to stay, ready my place to fill. Have you had this kind of vision of God? Have you made this kind of heartfelt commitment? Here am I, send me. Let's bow and pray. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would write the lessons of this passage indelibly upon our hearts and before our eyes. I pray that it will bless your children. I pray that it will go home with them, that it will encourage them and strengthen their hands I pray that you'd help us all to know that we serve a mighty God. Have thine own way now in the invitation time for Christ's sake.